David, nice, nice having you on the podcast. Thank you for making time to be with us today. It is my pleasure. How's it going? We're great, man. We're great. What were some of the shows that you were watching when you were growing up that, that made you go, this could be a job? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, SCTV was one that just came to mind. Um, Second City Television. Uh, I, of course, I loved watching Saturday Night Live and I loved um, shows like Taxi and uh, later Cheers. Um, and I know I'm forgetting some of the bigger ones, but I loved what I really loved watching as a kid was VHS tapes or beta tapes of Woody Allen movies and mm. Steve Martin specials mm. um, from NBC. Uh, th those were the ones that really formed me a lot and watching just like certain movies over and over and over again, like heaven can wait. Um, and just ingesting certain rhythms that made me feel, uh, over time, just comfortable because they were so ingrained in me. You know, whenever I speak to an American, I realize how rich your culture is steeped in television. It's, yes. it's you guys had Gilligan's Island. You had the whole, you had all of these shows that you guys were Starsky and Hutch. You can go back decades and find TV shows that your parents enjoyed, your older brother enjoyed, that you enjoyed, and to a point where, as a man now, you are writing TV shows that another generation enjoys, right? Well, it's so interesting how, how much we want to watch shows from the past, from before we were even born. I know I watched all the time, every day on syndication, those shows you just mentioned, Dick Van Dyke show, I Love Lucy, you know, from mm -hmm. the 50s, me mm -hmm. growing up in the 70s and 80s. Um, and now my own children love watching like The Office over and over again. Um, it's just sort of, uh, maybe it connects you to the recent past in some strange way. I don't know. I, I always think of it as, as humans, we crave the interaction. The voyeurism that sitcoms offers us is, is incredible. It almost feels like the characters are just standing there waiting for you to show up for them to start. If you're watching TV in South Africa, how much yeah. of it is American and how much of it is not? Most of it is American. I think we only started changing now a little bit with more content being on paid channels. But most of it, what we grew up watching was, I remember in the township, I was, what, maybe 14? And me and my friends were always looking forward to Mondays because we would talk about what episode of Seinfeld was on or Murphy Brown, you know, if we were lucky to stick around that long at night. It's so, so strange to me. You know, I, I, you get so myopic here because a lot of all those shows are made down the street from where I am right now. And that's incredible. And think of them and then to know that people grow up and uh, is it just strange to watch a whole imported culture as your main thing? But I guess that's just how it was set up for so long, wasn't it? Absolutely. And you must remember that in, in the township where English is not your first language, to have a group of friends, four of us, who just loved interrogating the gags that we heard and the scenario that we saw and, the, and, the, and what made people laugh. And it would, it would be adults, right? And it would be yeah. male, white adults predominantly that would watch sitcoms like that. And here we were in the township and we found that humor interesting. So we, we, we were unique in our way. So we started watching a lot of those shows and we recorded with VHS. And then we would, when we leave school early on a Friday, we would go and play the tapes and we would just watch them over and over and over. So you can oh, imagine cool. what a mind fuck it was. Sorry? I said, how cool that is. Yeah. So you can imagine what a mind fuck it was years later to watch a Jerry Seinfeld perform live. Then you yeah. go, I, I, me and my friends used to talk about the episode of Seinfeld that this happened and that happened and this happened and that happened. Now he is performing and you know, it just shows you that anything is possible and the world is so small. But I thought on Seinfeld, nothing happens. <laughs> One, one of few things is guaranteed to happen. A door is going to open. A fridge is going to be opened. Right. You know, he's going to be frustrated about something and then something is not going to happen at the end. And he'll have some cereal. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so what show, what, what show, out of all your shows, right? Do you, do you look at them as your kids and you go, which project was your favorite? Which, which project is filled with great memories? I mean, I really do... Uh... I, I, it's just my mindset. I really do love just about all of it. Um, mm. and I, I actually make an effort not to, to 
get too nostalgic just because I would, I could get, uh, I could look backwards too much and I, and I, I don't want to do that, but, um, I definitely, you know, I, I work on these things until I feel like I, I'm really in love with them, I guess. And then, and, um, so most of the movies and TV shows that I've done, I really do. Uh, I like I like the I associate the the result uh, about equally with just the whole experience of making it um, in my own mind, and so it's a different perception than somebody on the outside might have. But uh, so I mean, you know, each one has a different thing. Like the, making the first movie, Wet Hot American Summer, has its own very special place in my heart because it was the first time to do so many things and um and the 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 shoot was a really special experience of bonding with people and being stuck in the middle of nowhere and pouring rain all the time and i was younger and um but i absolutely love for example the thing i did last year medical police um which is a netflix show where we got to go shoot a quarter of it in croatia and we did like a giant action series for two cents and it was I loved how it came out and, um, you know, and I love what I'm working on right now. And I just, it, it's, I feel very, very, very lucky to have had the chance to over the many years work with my friends, mm -hmm. uh, and explore comedic ideas and, and been given the support to have them get made. Um, not so much during the last months of quarantine, but up until then. <laughs> When you when you look at Red Hot American Summer and you look at Medical Police, do you do you feel a vibe when you're writing something that's going to be such a phenomenon? No, I mean certainly not, uh, certainly not in the oh, those days with like you know when we were shooting Red Hot American Summer, it was a low budget indie movie, and our hope was that it would come out in any way. Like we we did we did not think it would get a theatrical release. We didn't we we just didn't we were just thinking, wow, we thought it was really going well enough to think like, wow, the, no matter what, somebody's going to see this. Our big goal was that it gets released at least in one theater so that the New York Times would review it. That's um, all you guys wanted. That's all you that's were all we shooting wanted. for. And as it turned out, it only did get released in like two theaters at first and then a smattering afterwards and then it never made money in, in, in the theaters. But then it just grew uh, years later, really. Um, it didn't make a profit for seven years until after it came out. And then uh, it was just over the decades that it really grew and grew and grew to become this like legendary movie in many people's minds, which is very, ne never could have been expected and incredibly gratifying. Yeah. And then when you think about then and now, uh, the new project that you have now on Netflix, did you ever anticipate it being so big? Well, I mean, not, now I have sort of the opposite sensation. Like when we were shooting the Netflix show, for example, I was like, this is so great. I'm super psyched and loving it. And then it came out on Netflix and it got incredible reviews and people were like, this is great. And then it basically petered out and no one really watched it. And so um, I have opposite experiences sometimes. I mean, most of the most of the things I've done, almost all of the things I've done have been commercial financial you know small to medium at best um but they enjoy a uh, a vocal and um loyal following uh, of a small number and i prefer I'll, I'll choose that any day of the week you know i, I read somewhere that humans have 60 60 000 thoughts a day uh -huh. how, how, how do you as a writer select one thought to turn into a movie or into a series? How do you sift through all your thoughts and go, this is, this is something? I do feel like part of the main challenge of the job or mm. the task of the job is doing exactly that. It's mm. uh, taking away your, um, your judgment or your inhibitions and just saying like, okay, I'm going to take this and run with it. But if, if you're asking like, how do I balance out the different things that I might want to try to do, or where do I put my time and energy and uh, um, attention? That's an ongoing challenge for me and always has been. Um, you know, where do you put your, your emphasis? Where do you put your 
because uh, everything's rolling the dice in this business, you know, and I'm not, I, I, I would love to be at the level where I just say, I'm going to do this next. And then yeah. I know it'll happen, you know, but it's more that I have to keep a bunch of plates spinning and see which ones land. And I, or, or don't land, I guess, in, in the metaphor of plate spinning. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I don't like that. I, I, I'm looking literally at my, on my board right now, I have like yes. 15 things that I'm working on right now. And I wish it was one thing. Um, and I'm happy. Really? I'm, I do. I am. Well, I'm happiest when I'm immersed entirely in one project yes. because one project alone is 40 different topics. Like if I'm working wow. on medical police, I'm thinking about casting and the scripts and the locations and the editing and the, you know, there's so many different aspects to making something. So I like that versus trying to think about 20 different projects. I mean, that has its, it has its rewards too. Sometimes you mm. shift gears and one sheds mm. light on another, mm. but um, overall I would rather be more mono-focused. I always think about Paul Rudd, the actor I've worked with a lot, who really has a brain from my observation that he focuses on one thing at a time and that's mm. it. And I think that that is admirable and I mean, he can do that, but I, it's a, it's a goal of mine to be able to think more in, the, in those terms. And it drives people crazy who are trying to talk to him about the next thing. Um, but he really gets his mind into the thing that he's doing right now. And that's it. So you aspire to be single-minded. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I think uh, monotasking is the new, the new thing. But I, 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 I think it's not, it's not for everyone. I think there's certain types of people whose brains will never function like that, right? Because yeah, I think... Pro probably in reality, mine is, I'm one of those. But, yes, because I, I think to be a, to be, yeah. to be a stand-up comedian, first of all, you'd know this better than anyone, that your brain works in a different way. You know, you've selected the gear that you're going into next while you're in this gear right now. So yeah. if, you were to, if you were to focus on one thing, so many things would just get you off of your game. So I guess exactly. it's, a, and, it's a gift and a curse. Yeah, I'm not a stand-up, but I, I really do um, admire stand-up so much uh, for that and other reasons. And, I, and I've always thought that at some point when I have the balls to do it, I'm going to try it. And like, But I feel like if I, if I did, I mean, I've done like things like stand-up or adjacent to stand-up my whole life, but yes. I feel like when I try stand up i want to devote like a year seven nights a week to doing it um to like to see if i can get that muscle in a real way you know how long how long before you start going on that journey because i think that would be interesting probably when my kids go to college would be the time how many years is that uh it'll be about eight years from now you do your kids think you have a real job do they look at you and go dad they're like aren't dad, you gonna go to work like other dads my, my, yeah, exactly. My kids think I am literally the unfunniest person on earth and also just like the biggest dork. And so, um, in fact, we were playing this game, uh, with other kids on zoom, like other family. And, uh, the, it was about everyone has to make different jokes and then you judge back and forth. And I came in dead last. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is, this is not bode well for me putting food on the table. Do your kids, do your kids know what you do for a living? Yeah, they know. And they like, they've seen and liked certain things. And then other things they've expressed, like I've said, you should watch like Wet Hot American Summer. And they're like, nah, <laughs> but they did love <laughs> Medical Police and they loved mm -hmm. Stella, our show that we did a uh, year, I guess, 15 years ago on Comedy Central. Are, are they your biggest critics? Do you, do you? Do you watch from behind the couch whenever they're watching something you've made and go, I hope they laugh? Like like the creeps that walk into theaters and, and look at the fans <laughs> reacting to a Star Wars movie. Well, we've watched certain things together. I mean, my, my kids are like, Dad, you're, you're uh, a dork and a loser. And then I hear them bragging about me to their friends. So I know that they're <laughs> putting on a face. I've always, I've always struggled with this, David. This is just me now personal selfish question whenever 
I am writing something. When do you know when you've hit a dead end? You know, with a joke, you know, because the audience lets you know, right? So yeah. whenever you're doing stand up, you know, when the audience hits that ultimate laugh and you know, you cannot go any further with the laughs, you know, then you yep. switch topics. With writing, I always find that you, I, 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 I just, I just end up keep going and going and going and going and I, and I never know when to stop because I never feel like it's finished. I think that you need those things that are the equivalent of the audience, which is, ah. could be, have someone else read it or you just, for me, a lot of times it's just it, hearing it read aloud in any form is mm. often so illuminating. And so if I'm writing something, you know, I, I often write with a partner, but we'll just we'll read it aloud or we'll get someone to read it aloud and we nobody has to say anything or give us a note you just just by hearing it you're like oh my god cut out those 10 pages or that's not working or this is this this whole aspect of it or this whole through line is going nowhere let's dump it you know um but seeing writing through another lens of some sort is crucial um you, you can't just sit there i can't just sit there and stare at something and then hope to move past whatever challenges in there mm. you just you just read it through and work it out yeah read it through hear it read through sometimes it's just changing the context of it literally like you know printing it out instead of seeing it on a screen and then looking at it as a piece of paper sometimes helps me see it in a in a different more objective light how, how, how much of 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 the writing process is one nostalgia and two fantasy where do those two meet? It, can you elaborate or explain that question? I don't understand. <laughs> when, 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 sometimes when, when, when you're writing a movie, right? Say, for example, you're writing Wet Hot American Summer. Yeah. You are most likely to go into your past and remember something that happened. Sure. A character oh, that I you see. know. Or, yeah. Okay. Well, certainly in that movie, it was a lot of nostalgia. We More than you might think. M Michael Showalter and I went through our own summer camp experiences and just sort of really charted out every memory and impression we had. And a lot of the stories in that were at least as a starting point taken from that. And then we added our jokes and our imagination to it. Um, and just depending on what it is, certainly medical police on the other hand is about experiences that none of us who wrote it had ever had at all you know it's about doctors who are secret agents traveling the world and uh, trying to uh, stop a, a virus a worldwide pandemic and um so that was more just fantasy and and playing in a genre mm. but i guess it just depends on the on, on what it is i've written other things that are uh, much more personal in their source and i've written other things that are much more whimsical in their source and everything everything has different um starting place or a seed that i try to stick to as as you go along you try to i keep going but whenever I'm, I'm working on many things right now where i keep saying to myself what's the spine what's the rudder what am i what, where what, why did i start this you know and then we keep going back to it and the answer <laughs> whenever you you get there yeah and sometimes it's, you know and there are many obviously there, there there's been hundreds of projects that ended up just not happening you know or going nowhere but one of the things i learned early on is and i'm sure you know this is a stand-up you you got to just give things a chance and you have to know that it's not going to be perfect to start and you got to keep have some faith in like any idea can be worked on and yeah. bent into shape and it may not be a masterpiece yeah. at the end, but you can make it into something. Um, yeah. So, and that quantity is just as important as quality. And if, and yeah. you know, if you, if you write a hundred jokes, you're more likely to write 10 good jokes than if yeah. you write 12 jokes. I think, I think the quality part as you get older, most certainly for me, it's you become more selfish and you just want, you want every process that you embark on to be, helpful and useful to you right, right. well so that, i think yeah so people always use the word no i i want to be able to be proud of my work and that's just another metaphor for it, how did this help you get through whatever you were going through yeah and i do feel you know as you as as i got older and mm -hmm. had children and mm -hmm. 
the, the world is the world. I just find that my entire work life has to now be put into a certain like the the, the use of my time becomes a very more uh, pronounced priority and like I want to make sure that I'm not wasting too much time just wandering through my brain. <laughs> <laughs> apparently when what apparently if you don't have money you give out your time for money and then if you have money you give out time for your money exactly and that's right but acknowledging that is is important you know um yeah like and i and we all do that like you know if you're if you have tons and tons of money spending most of your day clipping coupons or looking for discounts at the supermarket is probably not your best way to spend your time something like that i i always think how does how does wanting desperately wanting to earn money enough money to almost as if feel like you're buying your freedom right because that's what a lot of money does for you it just liberates you it allows you to be in places that you want to be in at the time yeah. that you want to be in and even people take something for granted like waking up at a certain time with the luxury of having money, something that simple becomes your choice, right? And well, yeah, I mean, just the, I, I still every day I thank I thank God that I don't have to uh, do something other than what I do, you know, to to make a living. And so far, I've been able to eke it out by doing something in the arts like this instead of going to do a real job and i i can't believe it i still can't believe it um and i don't take it for granted at all i don't think so i mean i it's like i know that uh, and, and i've worked in when i was younger i worked in various jobs and i you know i just you know i know that it's what it's like to wake up and go to work and not want to do it and yeah i don't i never have that i mean i i have I almost even even when I'm working on a project that's not my favorite, or if I'm doing a part of the project that's not my favorite part, I still basically enjoy what I do to some degree every day, and that's a great gift. How much how much of having not to worry about about finances contributes to the kind of product that you put out? Well, as a human being, just in general, I I, I do worry a lot about finances. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I, you Josh, hey, Josh, Josh is like you and I are on the same boat. Finally, Josh is like, yes. yes. <laughs> I mean, it's very strange because, um, but probably by almost any standard I make, I guess you would say a lot of money, but I, I really struggle to make ends meet every month and every year because I have, I live in LA, which is so expensive and I have two kids and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like. Um, and I do actually live a quite a modest lifestyle, uh, relatively speaking. And, I, and um, but so a lot of my, if I really didn't have to worry about money to answer your question, mm -hmm. I would do things slightly differently. But on the other hand, I have always made my choices in my career based on what is meaningful to me, not on money. Otherwise, I probably would mm -hmm. be rich at this point or might, might have had a chance to be rich. But instead, I've always chosen to do the smaller, weirder project and often lost money on it or didn't make money on it. And but I feel the richer for it because, I, as I said, I've I bought myself that ability to go into work every day and do something I enjoy. There are so many people who work in this industry and I see them all the time in L.A. Mm. who mm. spend all day long for years and years working on something they don't care about. And there's so many shows and movies that are made that you can tell nobody who's involved with it cares about it. You know? Really? Um, sure. I mean, there's just all these random TV shows on the air and you can tell they're just put out there because they're put out there and there's no, there's no brain or soul behind it where someone's saying, I want to make this show. I, I mean, it matters to me. It means something to me. And then there, there are shows in every genre where people do love it and do get behind mm -hmm. it. But anyway, that's, that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's my way of that's my way of abandoning a thought halfway through, and then just uh, <laughs> that was failing. The, that was the conversation version of closing down your laptop. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um,
what's what's your dream project dave what is the one thing that you still want to make i still i i'm dying to make i mean i've stepped closer to it my, my, the last movie i made was called a feudal and stupid gesture it was a biopic about um doug kenny who was the founder of the national lampoon it's on netflix um mm. it's great check it out but um i want to do something that's still comedic but like as a, a deeper more serious more personal feature film that 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 was that's kind of my dream um and uh cuz i love you know the trend more and more is people are doing more things in social media and shorter mm -hmm. and quicker and more immediate which is great and i've i've done that kind of thing also my entire life i did web series and stuff but i I like the idea of, I really enjoy when I get to take time to craft something over a years. And yes, what, what I love about doing a comedic feature film is you write a joke and it, and the joke lasts all the way through all the process of writing, yes. and rehearsing and shooting and through the editing and changing and then mix it all the way through. And if you're still laughing at it, you know, it's stood the test of time and I'd like to just go deeper into that process. You know what I've just I've just realized I've, maybe it's because of the algorithm on my uh, on my streaming services but now I see more and more of World War II stuff uh -huh. uh, and 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 I look at it and I go how many people has this topic employed? <laughs> like you look at you you, you it's basically from from history reenactments to um, right. depictions, you like this, the Nazi, the concept of Nazis has just over the years since television has employed. The fascination has never gone away. It's true. It's interesting. It has never gone. And they find these actors that match almost to the T how those people in that time looked in the uniform. And I go, how crazy is this that someone at some point, and I guess because I'm a big fan of past life regression and Dr. Wise, who, who pioneered the industry of past life regression, who yeah, regressed yeah. a lot of people that have lived past lives and they remember certain things so vividly and so well. And I always think to myself, how much, if, if that theory is to be believed, right? How much of those people involved in that kind of film? or documentaries or reenactments remember vividly somewhere in a distant past even if they don't know how that they used to be in that that they can play that part or direct that scene so well that i'm sitting all the way in south africa and going i feel like i'm in i'm in berlin it does make sense to me i mean i'm sure there are actors who make their entire life career as playing various types of nazis in different things because they look the part um or there are yeah i think that's pretty interesting that is that is crazy i i look at it and i go where where does the funding come from <laughs> for, for 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 pushing this agenda because i think wait is it is it is it funded by people who go never forget or is it funded by people that are pro nazi because somehow isn't isn't having that much content about uh, that painful era uh, r making people remember more and some people who are still alive now relive it? Yes, I think there there's always that double edged sword, but I th I think it's the the fascination with the extreme of that time yes. is what it is. You know, people yes. say like you know what was the craziest? What's who's the most evil man who ever lived? Adolf Hitler, you know, and like I want to know more and and you and what they pulled off just like everything that's tr tragic whether it's the fascination of the spectacle of the sinking of the titanic yes. or the spectacle of 9 11 um people look at the spectacle of the final solution and uh, inevitably there are those who then start to admire it and um, and then there are those who start to ape it you know it, it does yes. happen, you know and i know i remember in in um, high school, there were always those kids who were just like obsessed with Nazis and they would, mm. you know, research and read all the books and they would start to get, you know, the, the draw the insignias. And it, it's not that they were even, they weren't neo-Nazis. They weren't trying to, but they were 
definitely obsessed, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I just think about, you know, th there's probably companies that make their entire uh, income from creating Nazi uniforms for film and TV, you know, it's just <laughs> crazy. But that, th that's what I'm trying to say. And I haven't discussed this with anybody. And I guess you it picked just... me? <laughs> when wait let's hold off on this till david wayne gets here then we're gonna get into the nazi stuff <laughs> I, I, it was on my mind and i thought to myself isn't this ironic that an industry is now supported by the most painful part of world history there's a, it's a huge business. It's a yeah. huge commercial business. Like you're right. If there's a factory out there making these uniforms and these short sticker medals and they go, no, 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 it's not real. It's for this thing that we're shooting that right. makes it look real. Isn't the factory functioning the same as the factory that created the uniform? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I do, but a bit, you know, the, the, the other alternative is you don't do it. Like, you know, you have to, uh, forgetting would be worse probably, you know? Um, not being, uh, you know, I, growing up Jewish and, and, uh, I remember how important it always was to document the Holocaust and teach it to our children to make sure that, because as soon as you would forget, then that's really when it can happen again is what we were told. Um, so I still see that. And, and, you know, we, I was part of a lot of projects when I was younger interviewing and documenting survivors so that, um, really? before they died, basically. Yeah. So many. Yeah. Um, and that's, that was an ongoing, you know, Spielberg was involved in that sort of thing, just so that you have these firsthand accounts mm -hmm. so that you, because, you know, as you know, we we live in a, in a time now of very flexible truth and people, yeah. Uh, and a lot, there are a lot of deniers who say, no, that never happened. It's an all yes. exaggeration. So yes. now, you know, there's these hours and hours and hours and hours of tapes that me and others made where you say, okay, tell us exactly what you went through blow by blow. And then at least we have that. You know what I would love, David, I would love for there to be a documentary that, that tells us who are the people that shot most of those videos that expose <laughs> these atrocities that even now we're using them as references, right? Like who, if, even if, even if it was, cause I once saw a film where it spoke of the people in the camp who were secretly getting the, 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 the film out of pictures yeah. that were taken. Right. But I'm like, even the Nazi uh, soldiers that were there that were videotaping and documenting, I would love to find out the story behind the camera. Yeah, well, I know that the Nazis were very um, into filming their own stuff all the time. That's what they, they were massive documenters of their own activities. And I think that's uh, a lot of why we know as much as we do. Um, I can't speak with any more. Yeah. If I said one more sentence, I would be making things up. But that's yeah. what I know. <laughs> I've, watched, I've watched a great show called Hunter. Have you watched it on uh, no. Amazon? Mm -hmm. Oh, you must watch it. Hunter. It stars Al Pacino. Okay. He's in it. He plays a Jewish man who was in the Holocaust in the 70s now, 30 odd years later. And he is wealthy, lives in Manhattan, and has assembled a brigade of Nazi hunters. Oh, but wow. My God. It blew my mind. It, 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 is, it is amazing. It, it I, is. I'd love to see that. Have you seen it? A Marathon Man? No. Oh my God. That it's, is it it's on Amazon. Similar, it's a movie. It's a similar theme. It's a movie from the seventies about uh, a Nazi uh, death camp guard, I believe, or, or a Nazi killer who now is just a jeweler in Manhattan. And uh, they're trying to track him down. And it's, it's an incredible classic movie that I think uh, this generation maybe have, hasn't seen it enough. It is, it is unreal. Really? Yeah. I'm checking it out today. I, I really appreciate it if you do. In fact, if you could just watch it now and then we can continue. <laughs> I'm just uh, reminding. Oh, yeah. It's Dustin Hoffman and Lawrence Olivier and Roy Scheider. 
Nice one. Okay, I'm checking it out. All right. And I'll let you know exactly what I think of it because I'm, I'm in love with that era and I think a lot more people, I think if, if every history teacher would spend an hour a month playing <laughs> playing a movie that speaks to that era, it would, it would eliminate a lot, right? And then it yes. would educate a lot of people as well because it's, like you said, it's one of the most well-documented parts of our history and people must never forget. People say you shouldn't, you know, some people are like, oh, don't show the movie. It doesn't tell the real story, but nothing tells the real story. Everything is biased in some way or t through some filter. So a movie, a good movie is just as good as anything. I look at, I look at our country. We went through apartheid for a longest time and we're like 25 years out of it, but we don't have enough footage to show what the survivors keep telling people what happened, you know, and there's no interest to make movies that talk of that era, that painful past. And this was only love, 25 yeah. years ago. There hasn't been a lot of feature films about that, have there? Nope. That's crazy. Nope. You know, I grew up among a lot of South Africans uh, mm. in, in, in Ohio. Um, as it happens, my parents were friends with a lot of doctors, all of whom were from South Africa when I was growing up in the 70s uh, and, and 80s in Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, and end of story. <laughs> <laughs> It just sounds like I'm launching into some interesting something about it, and and I don't have anything else to say about it. And then you close your computer. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Zoom over. <laughs> hey, we have we have a segment on our on our on, on the podcast that we like. Our guest has to tell us the craziest story that has ever happened to them. You know, a story even if they told us it wasn't true, we probably wouldn't uh -huh. believe it because it sounds so true and so obnoxious at the same time do you have something like that has ever happened to you in your life uh, so i was um one time uh when i was living in new york uh i was um i had a job where i worked in uh, a hot dog uh like it was a, a store that sold hot dogs you know you could go you could a takeout counter you could order hot dogs and this guy came in and said, um, I, will you, I don't have enough money for a hot dog, but I can trade you. I'll give you my penis if you give me a hot dog. <laughs> and I was like, no, the hot, it's like a dollar 50 for a hot dog. And he's like, well, I don't have the money. And he took out um, a big, like sort of garden shear, he cut off his penis and then he <laughs> sewed it up with a, um, like a, a thread, a, a yarn, a twine, and he hands me his penis, which is still like alive and warm. Um, and, and I give him the hot dog and then he, he says, I only want the hot dog. And he gives me the bun back and says, put, just put the penis in the bun. And so he's like, I'll give you 10 bucks if you eat the, my penis in that bun. And I was like, well, if you have 10 bucks, why didn't you just buy the hot dog in the first place? And he's like, all right, you got me there, but still, will you eat it? And I was like, I guess. And so I put like mustard and ketchup on it. And then I'm like about to bite it. And then I'm right before I, I eat the thing. I'm like, this, this is nuts. I don't want to do this. Like what? Also, this is like just the whole situation is crazy. And he's like, you're right. You're right. You're right. You don't have to eat it. And so, and so he was like, you know, have a good day. And I'm like, you know, you too, you have a good day too. You made you made our night. This was one great episode. I enjoyed. Oh, is it night, night there? Yeah. Yes, it's wow. nine p.m. What a mind fuck. Have a good night. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. Thank, Thank you so much, David. Bye.